Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Live Session, Sunday Night Firesides, where I share information that hopefully will be useful and enjoyable to you. So tonight I have a really important podcast to make. Uh, I quit. I'm, I'm quitting. The question is, what am I quitting? And I want to explain this, what am I quitting, with The Matrix, a look at the movie trilogy, The Matrix. And I am aware that there is a fourth Matrix just put out 2021. I have not watched that one yet. So, But I do want to discuss and describe why I'm quitting. And then I'll describe what I'm quitting as well, because that's very important. Hey, Gail Capson, how is everybody? Tim Rathbone, good to see you, bro. Newton Lemos, yes, Brazil connecting. Go, Brazil. Debbie Joe, how are you? Good to see you again. Yeah, well, it's supposed to scare you in a way. Quitting is not an easy thing, and I want to try to describe why I am quitting but the question is, what am I quitting? And I'm going to use this Matrix trilogy as an analogy for what I'm quitting. Because it's important to understand that we all have choices to make. And I've made my choice. I'm quitting. Truly. So let's get on to the matrix. I want to analyze the matrix with you and then tie that in to one of the most important subjects that I can possibly think of to share with all of you. Hey, Daisy B, good to see you. And Moksha Raver, good to see you, my friend. Yes. Yes, and uh, John Rouse Barsky, good to see you. Yes, you got here on time. Good job, pal. And Patty Cake, hello, Patty Cake. We are all well. Yes. So, uh, looks like we have a good crowd. Let's uh, let's get started. I want to share now. I will unabashedly admit that I have unabashedly taken many of my ideas, and I have yet distilled down another gentleman's analysis of the matrix. He has a two-hour long video presentation on YouTube that I found really informative. And he had all the the pictures and stuff like that. I'm not going to have any pictures. I'll let your memory of the movie Refresh itself, and if not, then you can go back and rewatch The Matrix and see what, uh, hey, Mark Crispin, good to see you. Glad you could make it tonight. Dan Vogel. Yeah, I'm, I'm describing why I'm quitting tonight, and I'm going to share with you what I'm quitting. So I will use The Matrix, as I've been saying. So let's look at The Matrix, and I will tie it into my thesis tonight. The trilogy of the, oh, I was going to say Mark Crispin, Mark Passio, I mean, sorry, Mark, not you. Mark Passio has done a Matrix Trilogy Decoded YouTube, two hour long, that I rather found excellent. And so I am going to crib from it in many places, but I'm going to bring it down much, much quicker than he had in two hours. He did a rather in-depth analysis. There is enough here in my distillation that you will get the important point absolutely without question. So let me proceed on to this important topic. This allegory of the matrix is an allegory for our lives right now. In the movie trilogy, and I'm not going to worry about the fourth one, the first three movies, each one of the Matrix movies answers a specific question. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? 
The very important question, which the first movie answered, was what? Now, and the first movie was by far the most popular movie. It really, it was a runaway best viewing video. I mean, it was outstanding. It enthralled everyone. So the question we're going to analyze is what in this first movie? And of course, what is the Matrix? When Neo finally was ready to ask this question, Morpheus answered that the Matrix is all around us. It is control. That is what the matrix is. Control. That's critical to answer, to understand that. The machines control us. The culture that we live in controls us by dumbing us down until we are asleep. And the movie deliberately opens up on Neo being asleep. And it does this in all three movies. <laughs> Very interesting. We are asleep to the fact that we are under control. Yeah. That's what this show is about. Very interesting. Organized politics controls us. Money controls us. Organized religion controls us. Control is slavery. So we're not paying attention to the world, and we're about submitting to the collective authority. We are asleep, just as Neo was at the beginning. So the control is about each individual submitting to the collective authority. It is this idea that Neo does not like. And so he is brought into contact with Morpheus in the show. And Neo learns that people, startlingly enough, people do not want to be free. People do not want to be free. Being in fear and keeping your mouth shut. And the symbolism is fantastic in that when Neo was first caught, one of the agents actually sews his mouth shut with some kind of a glue or goo or something. He literally shuts his mouth. He's controlling Neo, right? Fantastic symbolism. They want you to know what is wanted of you. Only read the approved literature. Only believe what we teach you to believe, etc. Morpheus in Greek mythology now, this is remarkable. Morpheus is the god, the Greek god of dreams. So the names are even symbolic, allegorical of our lives today. This is so remarkable. So he is here to help us in our terrible position right now. And I mean you, my audience, and myself. Morpheus is here to help us wake up instead of remain asleep. Notice that there is a trinity here in this movie. Do not lose this fantastic symbolism. There are three main characters. Trinity, Morpheus, and Neo. There's a trinity. And Trinity herself represents the sacred feminine. And you notice in the opening of the show, the sacred feminine is under duress. She is being attacked. And this is one of the main underground themes in all three movies. Each one opens up 
with Trinity, the sacred feminine, being attacked or else in terrific distress. That is remarkably interesting symbolism, isn't it? So the three characters represent the three aspects of our own consciousness. Actions, emotions, and thoughts. Morpheus, Trinity, and Neo. Morpheus is intelligence. He, he represents uh, knowledge, truth, because that's all he promises Neo. You remember when he, just before, <laughs> just before Neo takes that fateful red pill, Morpheus says, I'm just here to offer you the truth. And then after he took the red pill and Neo is so mad, he's terrified, he's bewildered, he's confused, and he absolutely will not believe it, Morpheus then tells him, I didn't say it was going to be easy, Neo. I just told you it's going to be the truth. You remember that? That's very interesting. Trinity represents compassion, love, the heart. So Neo in this movie represents courage, conscience, and freedom. The spirit, the will, and the mind. This is all about the desire for actual freedom. There is something wrong with the world, and don't we all also implicitly know that? Don't we all actually feel that? I mean, this movie really hits us, the viewers, right in the solar plexus. <laughs> That's interesting. It's like a splinter in the mind. What a concept. Morpheus has this right on. It's like a splinter in the mind. Neo says that it's the Matrix. And Morpheus, of course, agrees. It blinds us from the truth. It's the world, the schools, the culture, the politics, the religion. And what truth are we blind to? That you are a slave, Neo, is what Morpheus says. Now, Morpheus, in talking to Neo, is talking to all the viewers of the movie because Neo represents us, the viewers, in this movie. The horrible truth is you are a slave, Neo. You are in a prison for your mind. When offered the blue and red pill, we have the choice to see the truth. The blue pill puts you back to sleep. Blue represents the, uh, the passive, the submissive. You don't care about what's happening at all, just so that you get yours. That's what that blue pill represents. It's cold, slow passivity. With no willpower to learn the truth, you just follow others' views, is essentially what that blue pill is representing. The red pill is advancing. It's increasing our knowledge in truth of the truth. Because learning the truth is a choice. It's using our will to learn and going wherever the truth leads us. It's the masculine aspect using the will to understand. When Neo wakes up, he's in a horror world. Machine tubes are attached to him, the entire system. And this system, whether it's political, cultural, economic, or religious, it has its hooks in us, just like when Neo first woke up in that 
bathtub thing full of all that gel and jello and jelly with all those tubes hooking into him. This is the symbolism here for us. We are dominated and we're controlled by the system. So the movie is trying to inculcate in our minds that we need to shed those hooks. As far as he can see, he looks, he looks out on the horizon, nothing but pylons of pylons of pylons of tens of thousands of people hooked into those containers. Then he stands up and looks down and as far as the eye can see, everyone is hooked into this system. And it's terrifying when you see the truth. They have no knowledge. Well, actually, they have, not only do they have no knowledge of reality, they have no reality. Morpheus tells Neo, you have been living in a dream world, Neo. I'm here to wake you up from the dream. That's Morpheus's mission. Fantastic, isn't it? That's such excellent, excellent use of symbolism here. So people, all of those billions of people that he could see as far, it didn't matter what direction, right or left, up or down, all of those people are in the system with no power whatsoever. They are what is maintaining the system. There's no freedom. And the symbolism is that they're all around us as far as we can see. Matrix controls what we are, what we think and believe through authority. Neo, in getting regenerated and strengthened, asks, why do my eyes hurt? And Morpheus gives the shocking example, it's because you've never used them before. We are not seeing is the idea here. He has never seen the world for what it is. We've never really opened our eyes. We're We've bought into the illusions all around us. The machines, that is the system, feeds on humans for its very energy to achieve its goals, not the individuals. The real world is shown to Neo, and it's actually been devastated. Nature is devastated. We humans are devastated. The machines, the system, they are running the show. The system is running the show. Nature be damned. Oh, we need more wood? Chop down those forests. Oh, we need more steel? Tear down those mountains to extract the metals. The machines grow us for its use. We're not even born anymore. We're grown into the system. It's our compliance with the system that gives its power and authority over us. It's when we agree and do nothing. It is machine intellect which is divorced from any wisdom that runs the show and makes reality for us. No thought or care or compassion, just intellect. That's what the machines want. The world of I don't care as long as I get mine, 
That's the matrix we're living in right now. The consciousness that feeds that control, the matrix system has total lockdown of society by keeping it ignorant. And yet we live in the illusion of no free will to change ourselves. We keep the people asleep to the fact that they are controlled and manipulated slaves. Morpheus says that we are turned into this, and he holds up a battery. I should have got a battery. That's one of the most electrifying scenes I've ever seen in any movie. He holds up a battery. We are made into this, a battery, energy, for someone else's use, not ours. That's the matrix. We are the system's fuel and energy through our dumbed down consent. It is specifically not control in a generalized view. It is specifically mind control. Keep people in a dreamlike state, in unconsciousness about their true condition, to keep people subservient, slaves to the system. They accept things at face value, and they believe what they are told. As long as the matrix exists, human beings will never be free. As long as the desire for control exists, we will never be free. So Neo represents the neocortex in our brain, the higher brain, which is the newest part of the brain. The new man, Neo, the new man. This is our signifying our next stage of evolution, the enlightened or the illuminated man, balancing the brain into one consciousness is the underlying symbolism here. A unity consciousness. The movie is saying what we need is to balance the right hemisphere of the brain with the left hemisphere of the brain. The analytic with the creative. The logical with the imaginative. The repetitive with the intuitive. The details with the big picture. The scientific with the heuristic, the literal, with the figurative, the sequential, with the irregular, the detached, with the empathetic, the precise with the general, the organized with the conceptual, the left brain is machine consciousness, and it deals with the analytical, the logical, the repetitive, the details, the scientific, the literal, the sequential, the detached, the precise, the organized. It's not saying get rid of that. It is saying not to use just the left side, but we are split humans. And as such, we are helpless against being controlled until we bring our will to determine that we will unite our own left and right hemisphere approaches into one brain, not a unified consciousness. And that is why this list is so important, because none of these can be left out. All of 
it is vital for our freedoms to give us the will to be free. So I'm going to read this list again because it's a list of almost opposites. And we are given the will to unite those opposites. Yes, it takes effort. Of course, it takes energy. But that's the price of freedom. We include the analytical with the creative. Notice how our society, our culture, based largely upon the scientific paradigm that we are under right now, only takes the half. And it poo poos the other half as, oh, that's just subjective. And so it's not even real. It doesn't count. We don't include that. And we follow along with that as if it is the truth. And they've never been able to demonstrate that. They just declared it. Let me read this very important list, which we need to unite and utilize all of our anatomy and minds. The analytical with the creative. It's not versus, it's inclusive. Our culture excludes so much. The cure is to include now, <laughs> right? Very interesting. The logical with the imaginative. The repetitive with the intuitive. The details with the big picture. The scientific with the heuristic. The literal with the figurative, the sequential with the irregular, the detached with the empathetic, the precise with the general, the organized with the conceptual. The left brain is machine consciousness, the slave consciousness, just accepting what happens to your or believing what you're told without doing anything about it. You just believe because someone said so. That is the first step to slavery. Only when we unite both sides of the brain with the heart, which is what Trinity in the movie symbolizes. She is the heart. Then do we wake up to our, to our higher selves. Because of course, we it's like we are completing the circle. We have the left half. Well, that's it. That's all you need is what we're told. But wait, that's not the full self. You complete the circle using the left half of your brain and the right half of your brain and bingo, there you go. Then we wake up. No wonder they don't tell you this. They want to control you. You have far less power if you don't unite your brain with your heart. Full circle. All aspects. This is what the matrix is allegorizing for us. This is what Neo represents. The putting our thoughts and our wills into action. This leads to the new woman. This leads to the new man. And that is Neo. This saves us from the illusion of the system, the control, in other words, the matrix. If we are to make positive changes in our reality, this is our course. Now, the 
famous fight scene. You remember when they first fought? Yeah. In that construct phase. <laughs> Spectacular. Neo wakes up and he goes, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> and Morpheus says, show me. Show me. This famous fight scene is all about our transformation, which must come from within. This is the whole crux. Our transformation comes from within, not because someone tells us, oh, guess what? You've done everything we've wanted you to, and now you're righteous. That's the matrix. See, accepting the truth and putting it into practice in our lives is the theme. But most people are so enmeshed in the system that they actually turn around and they fight to protect the system. You know, Mormon apologists. We've seen this. We see this daily, right? They fight to protect their slavery. They don't want to be free. They love being under control, being dominated, told what to believe, told what to think, told what to, to read, to wear, where they're supposed to spend their time and their money, right? They're hoping to avoid having true personal responsibility. The thing they are trying to avoid, the mind control system, is their God, their bliss, their heaven. When we can totally stop depending on our own attachments and desires, now see, this is very Buddhist. We won't have to do this with a war. It's not going to take a physical war. If we have the will and the desire to complete this circle in ourselves, our whole mind, with our whole heart from within, then we can transform. That is what Neo and us are to learn is to step away from the control system and let it fall. By refusing to comply, stop giving it our energy. The boy bending the spoon, you remember when Neo is taken to see the oracle. And we see that little boy who's sitting there and bending the spoon, and it catches Neo's attention. He, he kind of looks quirky at him. Oh, wow, look at this. So he goes up to that little boy. This says that the truth is there is no spoon. That's what he says. It's in the world of illusion. So we exercise our will over the illusion, and we can change it. That's the theme of that little boy with the spoon. That's very interesting, isn't it? Only then you will see that it is not the spoon that bends, because it's not there. <laughs> it's the illusion. It's not the spoon that bends. It is only yourself. Be flexible. Be willing. Be willing to bend to the truth that bends. He's saying you have to change in your mind and heart to see it projected out into the world, the external reality. Once you change, you can then begin changing the world through the heart mind with love because you've put together the heart mind, which is what Trinity Morpheus and Neo represent combined the Trinity. <laughs> Fantastic stuff, isn't it? Very interesting symbolism. Now, the Oracle woman, what she says, turn around and read the sign, Bubba. And he turns around and this sign is in Latin. 
And she tells him that. She said, well, it's in Latin. It means know thyself. Well, obviously, Morpheus thinks Neo is the one. He's not so sure. He, he said, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. I'll go along. Okay, you want me to go to the Oracle, and the Oracle's going to tell me I'm the one. Okay, cool. Let's do it. So he goes there, and she says, you know why you're here to see me why Morpheus brought you. He goes, yeah, he, he, he thinks I'm the one. And so you're going to tell me I'm the one. She goes, uh, you've got the gift, but it's like you're waiting for something. And he goes, so I'm not the one. And she said, well, she said, look, uh, actually I hate to do this to you kiddo, but, you really need to, you, you have a choice you're going to be making here shortly. Notice, you will have a choice because Morpheus thinks you're the one. He's going to sacrifice himself to save you. So you have a choice. You are going to be able to either save him or yourself. But one of you has to go. One of you has to die. You will make a choice. There is going to be a sacrifice. And he goes, uh, damn. And she goes, here, have a cookie. You'll feel just right as rain. <laughs> right as rain. I love that. She told him what he needed to hear. Had she told him in his personal doubt that he was the one, he would have turned around and performed the mission through ego, not heart. And he would have failed. He would have gone into the war with the idea I'm the one. I'm Mr. Bad, and you, you the chump. Agent, you can't hurt me. I'm the special chosen. But when he was in the Matrix and in that simulation, when he tried to make that leap, he failed. And when he fell and hit the pavement, you know, and he went down into it like a trampoline, boom. Then he landed on the hard surface. When he came out of that matrix simulation, he was bleeding. He goes, oh, wait, damn, man, that hurts. He said, you mean, you mean I can, that happens in the matrix? You can die in the matrix? And Morpheus said, yes, you can. But it, it's just a construct. But it will kill you. If you're not careful. Well, had the oracle told him, yo, Bubba, you the savior of the world. You the king, you the chump, you the man. You go out there and you manhandle those little pipsqueaks. He would have failed because he wouldn't have acted from his will and heart and mind. He would have acted on what someone else told him about himself. This is the whole point of the movie. <laughs> you cannot live your authentic life using your authentic will and heart and mind based on others' desires for you. You get to choose. Powerful. <laughs> really interesting. Very interesting. So in the Hermetic tradition, to actually know thyself is to know the universe to know the gods. We don't know ourselves. We have forgotten who we are. Joseph Smith 
I think, came closest. Now, you can believe, like I do, that there were some very signal, powerful teachings Joseph Smith gave without necessarily having to believe everything he ever taught or said or having to join his church. That's irrelevant. That's the non sequitur that Mormonism really loves to hammer home to you. Well, if you think Joseph Smith was good, then that means he's a true prophet and you have to join Mormonism or else you are condemned. You are an evil sinner. You see the control the careful pop psychology that so many of us fell for at one time or another. But Joseph Smith really did teach something sensational. Even in granting this, it helps you discover more about yourself than you will otherwise. And this is my view. You're welcome to reject it. It's all good. I don't have to have you believe what I'm saying in order for me to benefit from it for myself, right? When he taught in the King Follett discourse, you, you, everyone who's watching this podcast, me, I'm pointing to me and I'm pointing to you. You were never created and you have been absolutely e eternal. You weren't even born or made. You have always existed as intelligence. Now, Joseph Smith almost got the full Eastern point of view here, but then he went into that little bit of an egotistical thing, and he said, each and every single individual one of you are an eternal intelligence that cannot be created nor destroyed. So God had nothing to do with your eternality. It is just the basic starting point. That's powerful from my take. That does nothing to diminish God, and it does everything to expand and increase our own self-worth and value and power and ability, in my opinion. And I'll explain that in just a few minutes. See, we create ignorance, and yet we turn around and we create knowledge. It's in ourselves as we create our own consciousness to know oneself. She tells him he seems to be waiting for something. He is not yet convinced he's the one. He does not know it either here or here, and she can't tell him that. He has to find that. Otherwise, it is of no value because it will come from ego if anybody else tells you who you really are. You have to discover that. This is sensational. So, in his own mind, damn, I'm not the one. He has not got to the level of consciousness yet to know himself. That's the point. So after Morpheus is rescued, now Morpheus gets captured, of course. They start sliding down the walls. He ends up, he does try to sacrifice himself. And then that is when Neo realizes, hey, man, uh, I'm capable of rescuing him. I can rescue him, seriously. So I'm going to. And so he goes and rescues him. Well, after he is rescues, after he is rescued, he tells Neo, there is no difference of knowing the path and walking the path. Everyone has to do that in order to be free. You have to walk the path to be free. Real wisdom is not knowing. That's intellect. Real wisdom is not knowing. That is intellect. Real wisdom 
is knowing and acting on the truth. So when Neo gains confidence, he rescued Morpheus. And now that gave him confidence because the manner of the rescue in that helicopter, when Morpheus was running toward the helicopter to jump into the helicopter and the agent is shooting through the wall and he gets, hits him in the leg and Neo leaps to meet Morpheus leaping in mid air. That's the leap of faith without question. After that kind of a rescue, his confidence is building up now. And then, of course, Morpheus tells him what I just said. And so now, when Neo gains confidence and he fights the agent, what does Morpheus say? When, when Trinity especially is positively horrified, she goes, what is he doing? Because Neo sent Morpheus back and then Trinity first. And then when he got ready to go back after rescuing Morpheus, the agent shows up. Now, you don't fight an agent, you run. Because you can't beat an agent, so you run. And you hope, die. heck, you can get a line to get out of there. The agents are the boss of the system. They will control you. And if you disobey, they will kill you. They will eliminate you. So Neo turns to fight the agent. And they're fighting and fighting. And they're fighting and fighting. And he's doing fine. But the agent shoots Neo. Where? Right in the heart. And he unloads the gun in Neo. <laughs> Neo dies. In the Matrix. The next scene is so incredible because Trinity is back on the ship, the Nebuchadnezzar, which also has symbolic stuff that I've skipped. You can see that in Mark Passio's videos. She's standing by, by Neo in the real world where he just died in the matrix. And she said, you can't be dead because the Oracle told me I would love a dead man and I love you and I don't want you to be dead. So Trinity, the sacred feminine with love in her heart, kisses Neo back to life. He is dead in the matrix, in the illusion, but he's brought back to life in a higher consciousness in the real world by who? Sophia. That's why we love Sophia. That's why we Philosophy. We love wisdom. It is wisdom of the heart that gave Neo new life, that elevated his consciousness. This is a powerful symbolism, man. It takes the woman and the man. It takes the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. It takes the mind and the heart to know thyself. Fantastic. We are making an all-inclusive connection, not reducing things to just their parts. We are seeking the wholeness, W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. -E -S. This is what the matrix is showing us, the wholeness. This is fantastic. 
She is, co she is care, compassion, the energy and action, the only thing that can resurrect right action into the world right now here in our particular situation. The symbolism is care, compassion, action. It's fantastic. So let's keep going. Neo goes back in. And this time, he goes back in with actual knowledge of who he is. And he gets in, and there's several agents there. And they all pull their guns. <laughs> Neo says, the most powerful word in the universe. Do you know what he said? The word he said when he stretched out his hand was no. No. And the bullets all stopped right in front of him. And he plucks one out looks at it, and then drops it on the floor. And then all the other bullets drop. And the agents look at each other. And Agent Smith is in front of the other two agents. Neo starts running right at him and dives right into his heart. And he transforms Agent Smith you see all that spectacular weird bubbling going on. Fantastic special effects. His head starts bulging, you know, and that one little blob goes through his eye. And you're going, whoa, dude, man, that is spectacular special effects. And then what does Neo do? Agent Smith explodes into light. And the other two agents are now the ones who turn and run. Fabulous scenery. Phenomenal symbolism. We turn people to the light of freedom in the heart. Not using our guns. Neo said no. Not only to the physical war with guns and weapons and death but he said no to the control system that empowered him no fabulous stuff only when we say no to the control system are we really going to be reborn and come back to life. This is what the Matrix is showing. When bullets are now shot at him, he said, oh, I, I already said that. Do not acknowledge no. And do not give energy to the control system. No. That's the most powerful word in the universe. Do not acknowledge it. Withdraw from what is wrong and doing what is right. That's Neo. So now Neo sees with the new sight, illumination. The green matrix systems agents, all they are is code. That's all. Alice in Wonderland says that you're just a deck of cards. You remember when the queen and the king cards condemned Alice in Wonderland, and they make many allusions to Alice in Wonderland in this movie, very many of them. They mention her by name, in fact. But when Alice is condemned to death, when the queen says, off with her head, 
and all the jacks and the, the knights and all those people start chasing after her. And she's running. And then it finally dawns on her. She goes, hold it. She goes, wait. You're just a deck of cards. Cards can't behead you. She had taken it all for real until it until her eyes opened and she realized, but you're just a deck of cards. You're harmless. Because she said, no, you are not going to take my head off. Neo said, no, to the matrix, to the control system. No, I'm not going to fight you with weapons. I don't need to. I don't even need to dodge the bullets, just like Morpheus said he would get to. So this is the idea of illumination. He literally can fight the agents with one hand behind his back when they all start attacking him, because now he can see what they really are, and he can read their code, and so he has power over them. And this is the symbolism here where he's just standing there. Da, 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 because he's finally seen these guys are just a deck of cards. There's no, they're just nothing but code. It's just words. There's no reality to that control behind the control, except just words. So he literally can fight the agents with one hand behind his back. It becomes easier for him to now because he has new sight, new eyes. His eyes no longer hurt. Now he is seeing for the first time the reality that the Matrix is unreal. It is the dream world, right? His consciousness has elevated. It has transformed his personal power because he united head with heart and opened his eyes to see and do something with that knowledge. At the end of the movie, the system fails. Neo is talking to the Matrix and he says, I know you are afraid. You are afraid of us. The Matrix is afraid of change. The camera zooms in on the words, system failure, right? It goes right down to the last letter of system, which is M, and the first letter of failure, which is F, M, F, male, female. They have united, and that is why the system failed. And then it opens up a door between them for Neo to go through. Fantastic symbolic ending. They all are united. They're not fighting each other. They know who they are. The male-female consciousness in his and our brain has united into one consciousness and risen above the control system. That is how one way to read that symbolism. So that's basically the matrix. Now, I've gone for one hour explaining it. I've gone a little bit too long, but it's okay. The second movie answers the question why. This will go much faster because I have less to say in each movie. But it answers the question, the first movie answered, what is the matrix? It's control. The second movie answers the question, why? Why are we in the matrix? The movie opens with Trinity, again, the sacred feminine under distress, just like in the first movie, being accosted, she's shot at, and she's falling. Care is falling. She represents care, compassion, love, the heart. It's falling after being pummeled with bullets. And Neo is asleep still, just like in the first movie. There is still more for him to know. True, he's awakened, but there's still more for him to know. And that's why we are in the Matrix. We see the last human city in the second movie, Zion. 
Now, this is fantastic symbolism. In the Kabbalah, this is the spiritual center of creation. Joseph Smith said that it was the pure in heart. Again, that theme. Joseph Smith said, Zion is the pure in heart, not the pure in appearance, like today's Mormonism loves to stress. The shirt, the white shirt and tie, the missionary haircut, shaved, clean shaved, no tattoos, no body piercings, etc. Women wear the proper dress. Men, you dress this way, etc. We've got to look the part. That's not Zion. Right? The center of the spirit, a positive hope. For a better future world. This is Zion in the second movie. So there's conflict with Morpheus and the commander of Zion. Morpheus still has faith in the higher consciousness. The commander, not so much. He's just about the physical things to do in this world. We have a mission to do, and we're going to do it. We have to fight these things, right? The commander needs soldiers to obey my orders. Interesting contrast. <laughs> he is still in control consciousness from the matrix. If we're going to win this war, you need to obey and I need to control. You see, that's the matrix consciousness. He is in a linear physical thinking. In Morpheus's speech, he says in the battle coming, the way to succeed is to shed our fear of the matrix, the control system. Don't be afraid of it. This is Zion, and we are not afraid. We also see Agent Smith has the new ability to replicate himself. So now he can make other agents by sticking his hand into the chest of someone, into their heart, and turning them into the evil control system through their heart. He gives them a testimony, so to speak, in the heart. He controls them, and they become his helpers. Very interesting. Highly symbolic. He's destroying people's care. He's literally eating their heart, this control system agent. And it turns them into one of the agents, those who don't care, but only want to control. You know, <clears throat> bishops, state president, <clears throat> general authority, <clears throat> first presidency, yeah, still there. He does this first to Bane, who is one of the crew members of another ship. Bane means poison in Latin. <laughs> Quite the symbol there. The first one Agent Smith turns into another agent is Bane using poison. Yeah, that's how we become poisoned is through the heart. Bane technically means an agent of death. And so the control system takes people over through the heart, taking them closer to death is the idea. This movie is about conversations that deal with purpose. How will we use our technology to help or destroy ourselves. We need to understand what is driving your level of will. What puts our knowledge into action? Get over our fear and do the work that is required to gain our freedom. Liberty from mind enslavement is what we're fighting for. Understand the full potentiality of our power. Again, in seeing the oracle in this movie now, the oracle this time says we can never see half the choices which we do not understand. You didn't come here to make a choice. You already made it. You're here to try and understand why you made it. In other words, she's saying you have to get to the why of your decision. Why do we do what we do? Why are some still in the control system? And why aren't we in it? 
That's the thing we want to understand. That's what this second movie is about. She's saying you have to get to why of your decision. The primary motivating factors of behavior. If you can't do that, you're done. You're never going to accomplish your goal. So he asks, what happens if I fail? Well, she says, then Zion's going to fall, which means humanity. And uh, humanity will be doomed. The crux of the philosophy of this movie is right there. Humanity will be doomed if we fail to stop the control system. The Merovingian says that the one constant, the one universal truth, and this is a very interesting part of the movie too, when he goes to the, see the Merovingian, he says the only real thing is causality. Cause and conflict, the why, the cause and the conflict. He's focusing on the why. Why is the only real source of power? Without why, you are powerless, is the Merovingian's point of view. The key maker now, <laughs> here's another fantastic symbolism of this, of this control system now. He represents the unlocking of the subconsciousness's deepest desires understandings, deepest motivations, etc. Neo, in talking to the architect of the Matrix, he actually comes out and asks the question, why? It's about truth versus belief in authority. When Trinity is shot, whoops, sorry. When Trinity is shot through the heart, By the agent, Neo has her in the matrix, and he puts his hand into her chest and pumps her heart and brings her back. So now we see the yin and the yang beautifully connected. She saves him through love, through the heart, with the kiss. He saves her through love, through the heart, with care and compassion, and they become one. This is so interesting how they do this. We have to resurrect our hearts. That is the theme in this movie, to get out of, from under the control system, which says working through the heart is useless. That's just subjective. You always use just the intellect. That's our culture, man, right? This is what has put us under control of whatever specific matrix there is out there. There's lots of them, as this movie made clear. We have to resurrect our hearts, our care, in order to save us from control. We have to resurrect care by getting the heart beating again. That's the point. It's not about belief or faith in an outside or other authority. It's about using our will to affect positive change in the world. Have the will to act is what this movie's about. The third movie now is answering the question, how? So we've had what, the first movie, why are we in the matrix in the second movie? The third movie is how do we get out of the matrix? And this movie was the least liked one of all, <laughs> which is crazy because, again, people don't want to actually believe we're in the matrix. And if we really are, they damn sure don't want to do anything about it because it takes too much work. But the third movie shows us how this is going to happen, if it's going to happen, right? So here we are. Once again, the sacred feminine is in distress at the start over Neo in a coma. And what this represents, Neo in a coma, is right action is dead. 
and it distresses the sacred feminine. So this is pretty serious. The Merovingian wants the oracle's eye. Now the symbolism here is fantastic. Why would the Merovingian want the oracle's eye? This represents vision, prophecy, you know, seeing the future to give him 100% knowledge, total control. Trinity shows she will die and take him with her. So Neo is rescued from between the worlds. He goes back to the Oracle. She tells Neo that she sees dark death. Smith duplicating until he gets total control is what the Oracle sees. Smith, the agent, has now begun duplicating himself by the millions. And he is literally going to completely overwhelm and annihilate everything so that we go back into the nothing. He's going to destroy it all. And nobody can stop him. Not Neo, not the, not the Matrix itself. Agent Smith has now become the threat through his duplication of the black control. So, Neo is the only one who can do something to stop it if he does it correctly. He finds out that Smith is his opposite, his nemesis, total freedom versus total control. So, Smith is the tail side of Neo's head side of the coin. That's very remarkably interesting, isn't it? The opposites. Neo ends up getting blinded. You remember when he's in the fight, that guy took that electronic, great big electric cable and stuck it right in Neo's eyes, and it blinded him. This is highly symbolic. Now he is not relying on the physical senses. It's going to take more than the physical senses to get out from under control of the matrix. The spiritual senses, the insights, the intuitive must come into play. So it's a damn good thing in the second movie, Neo combined the left and right hemispheres of his brain, the male and female, so that it was a total, complete circle. He wasn't half a man. He was fully a man, fully integrated, so that when he lost his physical sight, it did not end his mission because the physical is not the only reality there is. There is the intuitive inner vision. And this is what Neo begins to use, the higher sight. So sustained with will and sustain, sustained willpower and sustained work is what is required to solve the problem of control. Now, the Logos, the ship, it crashes. The Logos crashes. Logos is the Greek word for word, right? It also means ratio, things like that, measure, proportion, but it also means word. You know, you think John 1 and 1, the logos. Well, the word no crashes. No, the most powerful word in the universe fails. It crashes. This is the symbolism here of the logos crashing. So now we can't rely on our words. It is the action of sacrifice that has to occur. We sacrifice our time, our talents, all of our money, if need be, and our very lives for freedom, or we live in slavery. That's why this movie was not popular, because our lazy culture has taught us that everything is going to be given to us on a silver platter, and we don't have to do anything about it at all. We just sit and enjoy everything.
because we are the highest pinnacle of creation. That's what this movie is disabusing. They will remain in control if we do nothing. Then control maintains. So Neo negotiates peace with the machine heart. He travels with Trinity all the way to the heart of the Matrix. So Neo goes and fights Smith. Smith gets to the point. Remember when they're fighting after he's negotiated to, to help the machine kill Smith or Smith will ruin the machine as well as destroy all humanity and the machine agrees to cooperate. He goes back and he fights Smith. Well, you can't beat Smith. You can't beat the agent. And after a while, uh, the agent is just absolutely beating the living snot out of Neo, and he keeps fighting, and he keeps fighting. And Smith finally says, why? Why are you getting up again? You, you can't possibly get up again. You have lost. You are defeated. Why do you keep fighting? And he is absolutely beside himself. And Neo is laying down there in the muck and the mud. He's bleeding. He's bruised. He's got broken. But he just had the tar beat out of him. And he looks back up over his shoulder and he says, because I choose to. And then he staggers again for the umpteenth time to his standing position. It's like Rocky and Apollo Creed. After Apollo Creed beat the absolute snot out of Rocky, Rocky keeps going. He, come on, come on, come on. And Apollo Creed goes, no way, man. I don't believe this. Neo does the same thing. The symbolism is we never stop fighting for our freedom. We choose to say no. And we choose to help others with their freedom. And how we get out of it is steady, continued, willful vigilance. A complete, uh-oh, what happened there? Uh-oh, I hit something and it's really fuzzy. I hope that's not on your guys' screen. Anyway, if it is, I apologize. I, I hit something here. I'm going to sit over here. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at my hair. I'm shot to hell tonight, aren't I? So, free will. Now, what is the one thing we are being taught right now in our day that we actually don't have free will? I do not buy into that bunk. I don't give a damn if it's a scientist giving me scientific proof just like Sam Harris says he has. I don't care. I choose not to believe that I can't choose. Interesting, huh? In the last big discussion I had in free will with a group, and they were agreeing that, oh yeah, yeah, we do not have free will. I told them flat out, oh yes, we do. And I'll prove it. I choose right now to step out of this discussion. And I did so. Uh, the bullshit has to stop. They are enslaving us by telling us, number one, we don't have the strength to be ourselves. We must do what others tell us. And then they're saying, we don't have free will. And I say, bullshit. I personally do not buy into that. If you want to, you go right the heck ahead. I will not. I choose to use my free will to reject the ridiculous stupidity that I don't have free will. That's my choice. If you choose to believe, just understand you're still choosing, using your own free will. You're not being forced to believe it, right? So I, I disagree with the interpretation and the evidence and all that. I don't believe it. Of course we have free will. 
we have to exercise it. If they can convince us we don't have free will, then we will never have the free will to gain our freedom. Won't that be the ultimate enslavement of the matrix? Don't you see? Are we still blind? This is, this is pretty powerful, important stuff in a way, right? So, Neo sacrifices himself, which destroys the evil, and the white light shatters everything in the shape of a white cross, because Anderson is the son of man. His name is symbolic. Anders, man, mankind, and then son. Anders' son, the son of man. He is the Christ figure, the Savior, the Messiah. What he represents is what we all are, and we don't know it, and that's why we need to go to the oracle. But the oracle is also going to tell us, well, you've got the gift, kid, but you seem to be waiting for something. What are we waiting for? The belief in ourselves, the knowledge that we also are the Christ consciousness. This is the message to freedom in this trilogy. Get that. <laughs> right? So the war between machine consciousness and humanity ends. In the end, the oracle asks, Zion is free. What about all of the others still in the matrix? And the architect of the matrix says something very significant. He says, the ones who want to get out will be freed. Will be freed. Showing that the ones in are slaves even though they're given the illusion of having their free lives. If you want it bad enough, the truth will set you free. So ultimately in the real world, who is the one? You are. That's the point. You are the one. And that's what the matrix, the control system, does not want you to know. And so I bring this around to the title of my discussion tonight. I quit. I'm done. Meaning, I'm saying no to the most dominant control system I've had that happens to be a religion. Just say no. Because it desires control. It has insinuated itself between you and God, and you always are not good enough, and you always are the guilty one, even for the system's faults. You are guilty of that. <laughs> so you have to repent of your sins. And who do you repent to? The system, of course. And they'll keep you on that little squirrel cage going round and round and round. They say, well, what we have to do is we have to test you for about, you know, the next six months. Let's have an interview once a week and see how you're doing. And they virtually focus you on your sin and how to repent of it so that after six months of weekly meetings, you have finally conquered the problem, and they know goddamn full and well you're going to go sin again within one week. And then they'll have you right back, and they'll focus you on your guilt and your shortcoming and your losing the Holy Spirit, and you really should follow the covenant path, and they will slowly sink their hooks into you and never let you go. And they are saying, you're guilty. 
No. No. The guilty bullets, the sin bullets that they say are being shot at us just fall to the ground. They're not real. No. I don't accept that definition. No. I don't accept your prescription for my guilt. I know I'm human. Of course, we're all human. And we're all going to make shortcomings. And we're all going to have shortcomings. We're all going to make mistakes. But I don't need to be constantly interrogated. And how are you doing? And, you know, I'll... no. You don't need to know any of that. I've sinned. I acknowledge it. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm human. Now I'm going to go on living right? I'm not going to focus on the sin and remain a sinner, even though I've been forgiven of my guilt, which of course is ridiculous. Men can't forgive men of guilt. Only you in your own heart, mind, can forgive. When you wake up to see that, I, I so promise it's a transforming moment. <laughs> I'm just I'm speaking from experience here. You got to at least try it. Yeah, I don't care if you're Mormon or not. It's irrelevant. You need to just try it. Rather than worrying about the control system forgiving you and then giving <laughs> then giving you permission to forgive yourself. No. It's much better to know yourself and to say, yes, I am a sinner, Lord. And all right, I'm human. And I'll work hard at not doing it again. But I forgive myself and I'm going to go on succeeding in my life. You don't have to dwell on the sin and the guilt and the fear and losing the Holy Spirit through a long Damn difficult six month or nine month or one year process. You can do it instantly and then go on with your life and improve yourself and seek to do better. But you know, you're always going to fall short. So that's the given. But that's where they, if they convince you to close your eyes to your own value, to your own worth, to your own power in here, here, that's where they can control you. And that's what I say. No, I quit. I'm done. No, really. I'm done with that guilt inducing system. I don't need it. No, no more. <laughs> so that's why my title is what it is. Yes, granted, I confess. I, again, I've just committed a sin because actually the title is clickbait somewhat. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yeah. So hit me with 50 lashes and I'll get over it, right? So anyway, that, that is what I wanted to say is we, our value and I know our modern culture tells us that the heart is not the place to go, but to the head. And that's only half correct. It's not one or the other. It is both. Sincerely. I The, the longer I live and the more I study, the more I recognize that's what has to be done. Mormonism says total heart and don't worry about your brain. Science says total brain, don't worry about your heart. And metaphysics, I think, has it much more accurately. Put it all together, functioning, and in use in you. Know thyself. And it becomes a very good life. Now there are still challenges. Make no mistake about it. You'll always have ups and downs. You'll have bitter disappointments. You will spend time crying from loss. Loss, loss, loss. You will be able to rejoice with successes and accomplishments and acquisitions. I mean, life goes on, but as we open our spiritual eyes and the 
the E says there's a third eye here in the pineal gland in our head. That's the Lulu. That's the one where you can begin to see the magnificence of the complete cosmos of which we are told we are. But if you don't know that, then it does you no good to be told by a guru that's what you are. That's why the guru very seldom will tell you that. He will lead you into all kinds of interesting things to wreck your own egotism. Because you cannot go on the hero journey as an egotistic idiot. It does not work that way. The first rule is get rid of your ego. And we know how difficult that can be. So, I mean, we all have it. So here we are. <laughs> We're still looking. So anyway, that is pretty much the, uh, oh, that's pretty much my, my information. Uh, that I wanted to share with you. Now, I, I'm sorry I bored you for so long. I, I'm about an hour and a half, so I'm going to call it good. Uh, don't forget, I, I do have my backyardprofessor.org podcasts back up and going. I am going to upload some new ones tomorrow night. I do have two new ones in the last two weeks that if you haven't heard, you're welcome to go and subscribe. Hit the subscribe button and the notification because I'm going to up my productivity now. Backyard Professor is on a roll. I'm going to begin doing both podcasts and live sessions and combining them into wonderful discussions and subjects on all sorts of things, science, philosophy, religion, history, spirituality, metaphysics, uh, chemistry, the cosmos, all of it. Geography, I'm serious. Geography plays a, a hand in this, believe it or not. So anyway, any subject that I like, and you can tell by the library behind me, there's a few of them I do like, and I'm going to start sharing both with podcasts and with my live sessions. So I am going to call it a night, uh, and I will, don't forget Wednesday nights, Mormonism Live. And then next week and Saturday and Sunday. Now, I, I didn't get to do any podcasts yesterday because, unfortunately, I, I lost my puppy. My companion for 14 years. The best pet I ever had in my whole life. And she got really, really sick and we had to put her down. So yesterday was not a very good day for me. And uh, it, it, was, it was tough going. Uh, it's, it's not easy to lose a pet who's so perfect for 14 years. So anyway, um, I, I did not have the ability to do any, uh, live sessions yesterday. So, but I will, I will do some, uh, next weekend and, uh, I will definitely, if, if something happens and I don't do anything on Saturday and Sunday, I will do Sunday night at, uh, 6 PM. So anyway, yeah. Uh, losing a puppy is one of the hardest things I've done. She was, <laughs> oh, she was perfect. Uh, hard, hard to believe, but she really was. She, she was just something else. So anyway, yeah. <sighs> That's part of being alive, right? See the life and death go together, but then so does death and life go together. Alan Watts is big on that. I'll do some Alan Watts with you too. So I was going to do, well, thank you all you guys. I appreciate all your sentiments. It was, uh, I appreciate that really. That means a lot to me, but, uh, life does go on. I, I, uh, we treated her well. She treated us well. We had a fantastic time together. <laughs> I've got mostly fantastic memories of her. So that's what makes having a puppy fun. So Okay, you guys, thank you for all your well wishes. Thank you for all your kindnesses and love. Appreciate all of you. And uh, I will see you. Uh, don't forget, now tomorrow night, a little later, I will I will upload some podcasts. So don't forget to subscribe and, and you will be able to hear some new podcasts coming up uh, just shortly. Uh, I'm actually doing the audio off of my earlier videos. And if you've never seen them, then wonderful. If you have seen them, I promise the podcast, you will still get new information out of them. Once I catch up, 
converting all the audio of all my videos, including all of my Book of Abraham videos, that will now be available on audio coming up pretty quick. Once I get that done, I will begin producing other audios, podcasts on myriads of other subjects that I don't cover in my videos. And so it's just, it's going to be a huge expansion of information where I integrate the the videos with the sound, with the hearing. So, all right, you guys, I got to go. Thank you so much for all your support and love. Be good, do well, be kind, have fun, and um, know thyself and realize no works. And if you can gain a modicum of freedom by saying no, several times to several different things that you know is dominating you and controlling you and making your life less than, then learn to say no. You don't have to be fierce about it. You don't have to cause a war. You don't have to pull a gun and point it up. No! <laughs> In fact, I would suggest you don't do it that way. Do it from the heart, and there's more power that way than with a gun. Do it from the heart. Conviction. No. Let those bullets drop. All right. I will see you guys very soon. Have a great week. Thank you for attending. It's great to see y'all. Hasta la vista.